two of our international webinar series organized by St. Berkman's College. It's indeed a great pleasure to have you among us today. I am Nina Abraham, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Dan George. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Nina. Here are a few guidelines that the participants are kindly requested to keep in mind to ensure the smooth conduct of today's program. All the questions intended for the question answer sessions are to be posted in the chat box addressing it to everyone. A feedback form will be posted at the end of the webinar in the chat box in both Zoom and YouTube. E-certificates will be issued for participants who are present throughout the session and will be delivered after the submission of the feedback form. Since all personal details are to be entered in the feedback form, participants are humbly requested not to introduce yourselves in the chat box as this might distract the speaker. Well, these are just some points to keep in mind. Over to you, Nina. Thank you, Dan. Next, we have uh, our assistant professor, Mr. Nitin Burgis, uh, who is also the convener of today's program to introduce the speaker of the day. Over to you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, dear Ridima resource person, Professor P.J. Thomas, head of the department, and H.K. Joseph, Ken Wiener, my colleagues and dear participants, good afternoon to all. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the second webinar in the international webinar series organized by the Department of English, St. Berkman's College, Changanashtari. Dear participants, I take this opportunity to formally welcome each one of you to this webinar. I wish you all a very fruitful and productive webinar. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk to us about the feminine matter, uh, reading through select short stories and letters. Uh, Dr. Rildima Tiwari uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences in the Indian Institute of Technology, Darwad. Her research interests lie at the intersection of gender studies, feminist philosophy, modernism, and the South Asian literature and popular culture. She has published in journals such as Feminist Encounters and Rupkada, and also undertaken projects related to women, globalization, and cultural change. She is currently the project director for the Indian Council of Social Science sponsored research, Women in the Intellectual and Historical Traditions of Northern Karnataka, a digital archive. Dr. Tiwari obtained um, her undergraduate and master's degrees from the Department of English, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Her doctoral degree was uh, from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. She was also shortlisted by the French feminist and philosopher Irigaray for a workshop on her works at Bristol in 2013. On, the be on behalf of the department, uh, on behalf of Dr. Professor P.J. Thomas, head of the department and the entire organizing committee, I would like to extend a warm, fraternal, and hearty welcome to you, Pridhima. Over to you, thank you. Uh, Nitin, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I missed the part actually where you were uh, introducing me because uh, there is slight change in the network that has happened. But uh, I'm assuming I can I can start now. Yeah. Sure. 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 Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for introducing me and. Uh, also for inviting me to, to deliver this talk. Uh, very thankful to uh, the head of the department, Professor PJ Thomas, and also the principal and all faculty members of your department. Uh, so uh, let me start out uh, by saying that uh, uh, I'm thankful to the webinar uh, mode uh, for connecting me to students uh, far and wide. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I'm still a little in awe of the whole online process uh, for all the online classes we are taking because uh, sometimes we are just talking to a screen. 
so uh, uh, it, it's it's slightly sci-fi but at the same time uh, extremely uh, uh, great as a medium that i can connect with students uh, uh, as far and wide as as it is today um, so uh, uh, can you see my screen uh, i'm assuming all of you can see my uh, screen ma'am actually no we can't can you share it again Can you see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. We can see your screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so without further delay and uh, uh, hopefully without further glitches, uh, now my presentation today is titled uh, "The Feminine Manto." Uh, uh, of course, uh, I will have to take a leap of faith and. Uh, Uh, assume that a lot of you have already heard of manto and uh, hence your interest in 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 the talk today uh, so essentially i will try to talk about uh, how i am defining or understanding the feminine in manto uh, and i will also you know uh, kind of read through manto's writing about five or six short stories and if uh, time permits then some letters and and non fiction as well uh, so now sadat hasan manto uh, has uh, you know suddenly uh, skyrocketed into a lot of fame uh, as a writer of that very very fraught partition era uh, of the indian subcontinent uh, so i will not really go into the details of his life uh, his uh, journey his struggles etc uh, but i will quickly uh, underline the fact that Uh, a lot of us connect Saadat Hasan Manto, who is of course an Urdu short story writer, with the partition era. So, uh, in some sense, the history of the Indian subcontinent, the birth of the two countries, India and Pakistan, uh, have also kind of defined the trajectory of Manto's career, uh, for good or for bad. So, for example, uh, a lot of us tend to reduce Manto to a writer of the partition era. Uh, i'm not sure if manto would would have us read him that way okay because there is definitely more to sadat hasan manto than just uh, you know a documenter of uh, the partition era uh, now uh, uh, let me start by by quoting a little bit from manto himself uh, and uh, please uh, remember that manto is known for this very very mock humorous vein in which uh, he talks okay so that's the favorite uh, a uh, voice that manto assumes he mocks everything including himself at the same time uh, manto's uh, uh, aura as a writer is extremely uh, self wrought now what do i mean by that there is a conscious attempt on manto's part to cultivate a certain mantoness or certain figure of the writer manto so he often splits his his personality into sadat hasan uh the human being the regular man and manto the writer who is who's kind of different so to give you a glimpse into what i mean i'm just quoting from from manto who has written on manto himself okay a great deal has been said and written about manto uh little of it in his favor and much of it is against him no one in his right mind will be able to form an opinion about manto I do not wish to go into the details but frankly speaking I have never seen a one to man like Manto in my entire life if we were to add him up the result would be three okay um so that's the kind of playfulness with which Manto talks about himself but at the same time that's the kind of uh, enigma he would you know have people perceive him as okay and this is very very self conscious uh depiction of manto as a writer okay so manto who uh, as i said uh primarily identified with the partition time but uh, 
has a, a lot to offer to us today as a writer. Now, Manto is no, no stranger to uh, global attention. Uh, and as early as 1956, uh, you had a set of his short stories being presented at Harvard. And uh, Manto being particular that he was about how he's perceived, made sure that he scrutinized the translations uh, himself. Now, when I say Manto uh, has, has gone global right from the middle of the 20th century, uh, even today you see uh, that there is a writer as far as Norway, removed as far from the subcontinent as Norway, uh, who recalls Manto uh, and his very, very insightful take on the Cold War politics of that time. Now, remember, Manto was writing in the non-internet era, but uh, his letters to Uncle Sam, which is uh, another way of addressing America, uh, anticipate the way uh, America has become this neo-colonial uh, uh, giant. So Tony Usman is a Norwegian writer today. He writes plays. Uh, and he says that, you know, nobody uh, anticipated the global scene better than Manto. So, so that's the kind of homage Manto continues to receive uh, even today. Now, one, uh, one other myth about Manto today is that uh, Manto is probably uh, aloof. Uh, you know, slightly cut off from politics. He's this absurd uh, genius uh, like Kafka, uh, who had, um, who did not have much invested in politics. Now, uh, his, his biographers, in fact, if you look deeper, say that Manto was in fact idolizing people like Bhagat Singh from very early in life. So there is a photo of Bhagat Singh on Manto's desk uh, while he was growing up. Uh, and he grew up in, in Jalandhar and in Amritsar. And uh, he ultimately migrated to Bombay, which became the soul of his creative work, uh, the city of Bombay. Uh, we'll come to that later, how important this whole uh, uh, breaking up of the Indian subcontinent was for Manto. Uh, at the same time, episodes from Indian history, like the Jallianwala Bagh episode, left a tremendous impact on Manto because his first short story, Tamasha, was born out of this, this uh, trauma that he saw unfolding at Jallianwala Bagh. So, so, you know, we may think Manto was aloof and, you know, he, he wrote these uh, very, very uh, bitter, absurd portraits of his time, but Manto was uh, deeply entrenched in the, uh, in the politics of his time. His writing was very much a product of it. Uh, now, uh, Another important point to mention here is that, that uh, Manto was very much uh, uh, re into reading global literature around him, uh, especially th uh, the one emerging from say, countries like Russia or France. So as you can see, Chekhov, Gorky, Mom, Maupassant, uh, he, he read all of them. And these have kind of shaped the kind of literature Manto ultimately produced. Now, uh, there is a very important uh, literary movement that was happening at that time. And I'm talking about 1920s, 30s, 40s of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, this was the progressive writers movement uh, who were left inclined and wanted to write uh, to bring social change. Now, while Manto's writing is deeply entrenched in politics and society, Manto always remained a little uh, wary of for forging any clear cut political alliances. I think that's what gives this popular assumption that Manto was not political. But since politics is everyday uh, matter, politics is what we breathe, like we breathe oxygen, Manto was, in that sense, extremely political. But he fell out with the progressives because he did not want his writing to be put in any straight jacket. Okay. So uh, on that note, let me also tell you that uh, when I try to read Manto as a feminine writer today, this is also just an attempt to, to appreciate the imaginative power of Manto. This is not the only way in which Manto uh, comes across as, as you know, endorsing women's cause or the feminist cause. Okay, This is just my take on what could be done with the creative genius uh, that Manto is. Okay, uh, so I would request you to note the fact that Manto was, uh, uh, in that sense, a visionary. He saw changes of globalization, postmodernism, uh, American uh, supremacy, uh, much earlier than what we are witnessing today. 
Okay, so very quickly, uh, I will introduce uh, another uh, thinker to you. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, of Luce Erigare. Uh, Luce Erigare is clubbed broadly as French feminist, but uh, she's French only because she uses French as a medium of, uh, of writing. She's in fact a Belgian. Now, Luce Erigare is, uh, is in fact thought of as a, a, a revolutionary thinker today and not just a feminist, uh, because as one of her uh, most well-known critic, Margaret Whitford says, there has always been a visionary aspect to Erigare's work, okay? And uh, when she writes, she has a tendency to bring the past, the present, the future together, interweaving it, okay? Uh, so there is very, uh, it, is, uh, it does not do justice to uh, limit Erigare's writing as simply feminist. A lot of people see her as rewriting philosophy, history, and uh, discourse in general, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is both Manto and Erigare are in some sense uh, thinkers who cannot really be, you know, straight jacketed into a mold. And uh, I intend to make use of a lot of Erigare's uh, insight into contemporary culture to read Manto today, okay? Uh, so when we say French feminism, I'm sure all of you know of uh, Judith Butler, Helen Sizu, Julia uh, Kristeva, and uh, in fact, Spivak uh, today also finds a lot of ideas of French feminism very, very relevant. So I will make a detour through all that. Okay, uh, so since I mentioned Manto, is uh, primarily a short story writer. Let me quickly uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the Urdu short story. Now, uh, apart from this, these very, very funny and light essays, letters to Uncle Sam, uh, which is America, that Manto wrote, uh, Manto also produced uh, a lot of short stories and short stories were his preferred medium, in fact, for articulating uh, everything. Now, uh, of course, the short story has its own uh, very, very rich uh, hybrid cultural history. Uh, so uh, critics like M. Asaduddin believe that it came into the Indian subcontinent through the Persian or Arabic narrative tradition, okay, the Kissa, the Hikaya, the Dasta. Uh, but also in Indian tradition, you might be knowing of the uh, Jataka tales, the Hitopadesha, the Panchatantra. So the short story has always been a very, very rich and complex way of storytelling. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to the Urdu short story, interestingly, uh, Prem Chand, whom we identify as a Hindi writer, was uh, in fact somebody who shaped up the Urdu short story as a tool of social realism and social critique. Okay, so as I said that uh, Manto today uh, is also called upon to provide testimony of the partition era. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, with the coming of, uh, you know, new kinds of historiography, like as you see in the subaltern studies group, uh, there are sociologists like Ritu Menon, Kamla Bhaseen, Urvashi Butalia, Gyanendra Pandey, uh, a whole lot of thinkers from the subaltern school who believe uh, we need to fill in important gaps in historical records as they exist. There is an alternate history out there that needs to be constructed uh, of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, same applies to the history or the historiography of partition. And I think this is where Manto's writing has really come into, uh, into focus, you know. Can we use literature, can we use records like Manto's for understanding uh, the partition history better? Okay, so this is one strand of, of what Manto provides us today, but it's a very significant strand. Uh, now, I particularly believe uh, that uh, Manto's uh, legacy has received a boom, if I can call that, uh, with his birth centenary in 2012. So I started my PhD uh, research. Uh, this is primarily coming from, uh, from my PhD research and uh, uh, those of you who are people in PhD know the kind of you know enthusiasm as well as naivety that goes into writing uh, your first real document. So when I was starting my research on Manto in 2009, 
uh, I found uh, things primarily in Hindi or Urdu. Uh, as the Mundo was not all over the internet or in films as he is, he is today. So I think the birth centenary in 2012 really brought him at the forefront of uh, literary and academic uh, uh, discourse. Uh, and the other tendency that, that a lot of critical discourse uh, has is to talk about how Manto's women are the focus, uh, they are fallen creatures, uh, he is in, in love with uh, the marginalized figures like the subaltern, the destitute women, the prostitutes, uh, and you know, we tend to eulogize that aspect of Manto's writing. So when I try to, you know, uh, uh, understand and uh, uh, point out to you what is feminine in Manto today, I would try to steer clear of, uh, of uh, limiting Manto to the partition era specifically. And also, uh, I would try to steer clear of talking about Manto's women as fallen or destitute creatures. So, so I would try to have uh, a different perspective on Manto's uh, feminine aspect and, and we'll see how, how that goes. Okay. So what do I mean when I say uh, feminine manto? Now, first of all, uh, most uh, biographers of manto today, uh, at the very apparent level, talk about how manto was always influenced, surrounded, inspired by women in his life, starting with his wife, Safia, to his soul sister and writer. I'm sure some of you must have heard of Ismat Chuktai. Uh, very few people also know that Manto's elder sister, Iqbal, had an important role to play in shaping his literary career. Uh, as is the case with Manto's mother, whom he called Bibi Jan. Okay? So Bibi Jan and uh, Iqbal uh, really uh, you know, appreciated Manto's uh, writing and encouraged his penchant for, for storytelling. Uh, of course, uh, Bibi Jan's support for Manto is, is documented through multiple letters also. Uh, appreciating her son is very clever and promising. Okay, now, apart from this very, very obvious uh, bonding with women that, that Manto had, uh, Manto's articulation of the project of writing itself, okay, his, his approach to creativity also, uh, in, all of these employ metaphors that are steeped in the bodily, okay? Uh, now, what do I mean by that? For example, in one of his personal writings, Manto uses the analogy of reproduction and laying eggs for writing. So as I said, he was fond of talking about Manto as a separate entity, the writer. So here he tells, uh, I know when he has to write a short a story, he's like a hen about to lay an egg. Uh, so he sits in his chair with legs up, laying his eggs, uh, and uh, they cluck away and turn into short stories, okay? So uh, it is very, very interesting that somebody writing, uh, using the Urdu short story as a medium in the 1930s and 40s, says that, you know, Manto uh, can be only compared to a hen laying eggs. The other thing he mentions here is that, you know, a hen at least uh, lays eggs uh, somewhere around its uh, nesting place, but Manto likes doing it publicly. So that's the kind of very, very self-conscious, well-wrought image of himself as a writer that Manto presents, but, but using all these metaphors of reproduction and the, and the bodily. Now, those of you who've, who've had exposure to French feminism uh, might be knowing how important these metaphors of the body are, okay? I will also touch upon uh, the, these things briefly. There's another important uh, critic of Manto, uh, the late Professor Alok Bhalla. Uh, now he says, uh, of course, digging up facts about Manto's life, that Manto would write just sitting on a table with all the noise of his household around him, his daughters talking, cooking, everything. So he compares with writers like uh, Bucci and Michela. Uh, and, uh, a lot of women writers go through this kind of, of ex an experience when they write, okay? They write amidst the very hustle and bustle of, of reproduction, cooking, uh, noises of the household. So that is the, the kind of environment that Manto also draws from when he writes, okay? Uh, okay, now this is again Manto talking about how the writer in him reacts to socio-political upheavals. So uh, 
the political in like a cesarean section okay this is again a metaphor of birth a new period is being forced out of the old okay uh, and in all this fears of impending death the new born is also here uh, with bringing the joy of life okay uh, so all these metaphors of tears uh, wailing birth cesarean section are also uh, inspiring a creative writer like manto so this is what i mean when i say he employs uh, many many more creativity and birth in his in his etching of manto the writer okay so uh, now what i intend to do is i intend to take manto to another part of the world and see how much can we collaborate between the urdu writer who was such a visionary and uh, a french feminist like louise irigaray who continues to be a philosopher uh, and writer today uh, so before i take manto abroad there is also a gap between uh, the indian subcontinent the context of india and uh, of course french feminism which is seen as a western mode of of thinking now uh, this is not new uh, a lot of feminists in india today say that we need to cross over and and bridge the gap between uh, subcontinent and western feminism if i can use that term uh, for example uh, you might have heard of chandra talpade mohanty uh, so she says that you know uh, we must uh, have feminism without borders okay we must cross over but we must ensure that we are theorizing experience so uh, it's not like you can just uh you know draw upon french feminist ideas or american ideas and not locate them in a historical and political context so when i talk about manto borrowing from irigare uh i will try historicizing the kind of discourse manto produced okay it is very important to locate political uh, agency and not just switch over to a western feminist uh, framework these are challenges that we also face as as researchers now uh, another thing talpade points out is we are anyway living in a global world okay there is free free flow of goods and uh, and language and commodities so we we need to collaborate with feminists out there but this feminism needs to be radical anti racist and non heterosexist okay uh, okay uh, also uh, as i said that when we write about third world women we have a tendency to only talk about their terms of oppression uh, how they are oppressed so i i will try to see how how all of these are addressed when we borrow from uh, luce irigare to study some of the writings of of mando okay uh so one way of of distinguishing french feminism from say anglo american uh criticism is french feminism does not uh talk about thematic reading okay uh french feminism takes on a, a far more radical approach towards all discourses so what do i mean by that uh so whether it is philosophy or language or religion or psychoanalysis all of these are addressed or in some sense reworked by french feminists okay so uh i i i think if we think about philosophy as some of you might already be aware uh, when we think of philosophy we think of a genealogy of male writers from socrates to to plato to aristotle to nietzsche to hegel okay so so philosophy uh, uh, despite being the mother of all other uh, knowledge systems uh, is is still a very very male dominated uh, domain the same holds true for uh, uh, for literary theory i suppose okay when we think of theorization uh, uh we think that there is a strict boundary between theory and and creative writing but what french feminism does is it breaks that barrier between between hardcore theory and creative writing so when you read a kristeva you will see she is talking uh, creatively about birth reproduction uh, fluidity she is also talking about a uh, breaking theoretical ground okay she breaks new theoretical ground uh, the same holds true for somebody like sizu you might have read the laugh of the medusa okay 
so not only is she writing a new version of the laugh of the medusa she is also contributing to a new kind of theory okay uh, so this is what i mean by the fact that uh, the french feminists uh, they they strike right at the core of these dualities okay uh, the fact that you know you can either do do theory or you can either do do creative writing you can do both and and women generally have not done enough uh, same with psychoanalysis when you think of psychoanalysis and its impact on our approach to to reading and writing it's it's a, it's a genealogy of of men so this is where the french feminists uh, come in okay so as i said that the incorporation of the of the bodily feminine metaphors reproduction fluidity caress pain pleasure okay this attributes what the french feminists have called ecriture femini okay which means female writing okay okay uh, in fact sisu goes as far as to say that language is itself uh, is a body function okay so uh, what are they looking at is to bring back revolutionary change by bringing the maternal or the mother love back into our discourses now i will explain this this uh, in detail as we go further but the important thing to note uh, for us here is ecriture feminine or female writing does not mean writing only by women okay uh, for example sisu clearly says that male writers like kafka do provide uh, examples of feminine writing because this writing is not writing coming only from men or women it is any writing that involves respect for the other and an honest appraisal of the self's own needs okay so what do i mean by that now uh, uh, when freud says uh, anatomy is destiny uh, it's the little boy who is the focus of freud's uh, oedipus complex or the entire psychoanalytic discourse similarly in philosophy when he when we say that that uh, you know um uh man is the center of the universe okay uh, uh we assume that the subject being spoken of in philosophy is a neutral subject okay is genderless okay but that is not true the subject has always had a gender it's just that the gender has not been uh, a, a a female one okay so the attempt of the french feminists is to is to challenge philosophy challenge history challenge psychoanalysis and bring two sets of subjectivity you cannot have uh, you know just the male self uh, being the center of philosophy or uh, or psychoanalysis you need to have two subjectivities the male and the female so that's the primary uh, approach of the french feminists okay now uh, luce irigare if you if you uh, read more about her you will see that she is not just a writer or a theorist she actually trained will into into understanding this notion of two subjects okay uh, she is in fact trained people in parts of italy uh, and written books about them uh, her books talk about multiple things you know from writing uh, to plato to freud to laka to uh, indian traditions of yoga meditation okay so it's a very diverse uh, uh, range of of thinking that irigare puts forward uh, the more important thing to note, note about irigare is that uh, she has had a first hand experience of of uh, trying to rewrite uh, history from within now what do i mean by that uh, she was part of the school that la ka himself had set up in in paris ecole freudienne de paris and uh, she obtained her degree and her training from there but once she wrote this very very sensational book called speculum of the other woman irigare was completely isolated uh, she had to quit uh, and 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 shift somewhere else so that's the kind of a first hand experience of trying to change the system from within that thinkers like irigare irigare have so as long as her writing was aligned with lacanian thinking uh, uh, her her academic career was going smooth but later she faced challenges because of of writing a book which critiqued lacanian thinking okay uh, so uh, 
she refers to antigone uh, she refers to alice uh, alice in wonderland and she says that we need to move away from all our discourses as they exist and rethink them okay uh, uh, so so for example uh, where i say speculum her book is called speculum speculum is nothing but a, a glass that is used to examine cavities of the body so she says women have been under the gaze for far too long it is time for us to to change that that mirror back okay and if possible travel through the mirror so if you remember and this travels in uh, the mirror to explore another world okay so those are the uh, the existing literature she draws upon and she tries to rewrite them now what what do i uh, what am i trying to do in the current lecture so in the current lecture i have uh, i have two main aims uh, one is to to try and understand if manto's writing can provide us examples of acute femini as sisu thinks kafka's writing has potential uh, to be studied as and how do i do that i do that by borrowing some concepts from thinkers like irigare and even fuko uh, libidinal economy hysteria and mimesis civic identity and sexuate rights so using these concepts uh, in manto's writing i try to see if manto can probably be be uh, you know taken on another creative imaginary plane and studied from this perspective is manto talking about universal change is he talking about an alternate subjectivity so that's what i try to get at uh, without you know reducing him to a writer of of the partition era okay uh, so libidinal economy uh, what do i mean by libidinal economy now this is a concept given to us by by uh, a lot of french feminists but uh, more so by irigare now i don't have to tell you this very very uh, famous quote from freud that anatomy is destiny uh, so this is the the entire perhaps the most vital statement on which uh, freud's uh, psychoanalytic uh, principles are based okay now when i say that that irigare uh, will rewrite or challenge some of the premises of psychoanalysis uh, she is using psychoanalysis more as a critical and deconstructive tool okay to break down the myths of psychoanalysis to unravel the problems of psychoanalysis now uh, so she she doesn't really uphold uh, you know the, the very very uh, sacred laws of psychoanalysis as proposed by freud or laka she in fact tries to break them down and deconstruct tell you that look this is the problem this is why uh we cannot really think of uh, a universal understanding of our civilization based on psychoanalysis because uh, it's the little boy who's at the center of freud's remark that anatomy is destiny the little girl is always described in terms of lack okay so here is a very important work of irigare uh which is called this sex which is not one and uh, she says that in our social order women are products they are used and exchanged by men so essentially their status is of merchandise commodity uh, commodities and they are just used as you know a currency for transaction uh, so in that sense women are infrastructure but infrastructure uh, which is used consumed and circulated they have never taken part as subjects okay uh so this is fairly uh, obvious a point uh and uh, i'm sure if all of us think a little deeper we already know these facts that you know uh women are passed around uh traditionally women have been exchanged as objects uh to maintain relations between men okay um okay now uh another person who has expressed similar uh, uh ideas is the anthropologist levi strauss uh, he talks about the polygamous tendencies in men that make them exchange women okay uh so men exchange women but why do they do that to maintain the social and cultural business of theirs okay uh, so so if you think of uh, marriages okay where this is the most obvious example of the exchange happening between men okay the exchange of women uh now what i try to do is i try to borrow this framework 
to understand something called the recovery operations which happened in the indian subcontinent after uh, the partition of the country okay so this whole analogy of women being exchanged to maintain a homo social order to maintain uh, the cultural and social and political business of men i try borrowing that for understanding why women were exchanged uh, at the time of partition now uh, along with this you know this kind of cultural understanding of women as products also makes you realize that what happened in partition was not really an exceptional episode it is not an aberration okay it is not you know um, uh, a rare violent outburst of uh, 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 of a fraught community okay this is a a, a social anthropological uh, pattern which has existed for the longest time okay so in that sense partition the violence the exchange of women is not an aberration but it is reflective of what stross calls the deep polygamous tendencies in our culture now to to substantiate my use of this this model from from outside the indian subcontinent so to speak uh, urvashi butana kamla bhasin all of them recognizing that women were given no agency whatsoever uh, when they were being taken from one country to another so so after the independence and establishment of the two countries uh, the governments together set up recovery operation they had an understanding that women uh, of one religion should be brought back to uh, say say muslim women should be handed back to pakistan and hindu and sikh women should be handed back to india okay so you just recover and reestablish them without giving them any agential capacity okay so when irigare talks about how the Come to main order. Well, sure, this so agree with with same. Okay. Uh, he says that look, if we don't exchange women, we will fall back into into anarchy. uh am, am i audible uh, i i thought my internet uh, went off for for a bit okay uh so irigari says that look if we don't exchange women uh we will fall back into anarchy uh and women uh need to be exchanged uh and women need to be exchanged so that men can pay each other okay uh so women are products objects to be used and objects of transaction among men alone so you need men to exchange women to turn them into products and in that sense at least assign some value to women otherwise women have no uh, no value no subjecthood as as such okay uh now the problem other problem with just exchanging women as products and of course it's a big problem Uh, is the fact that women never really participate in body politic or the making of of the civil state or of the nation all they do is to exist in the state of nature uh, as symbols uh, and i will come to that uh, later in my presentation uh, so essentially when i say libidinal libidinal energy or libidinal economy i'm talking about libido which is a psych psychological force in the in the framework of laka and freud okay i'm sure you've heard of the whole idea of male desire turning something into an object okay so it is the transact possess these commodities that turn women into uh, into objects that can be exchanged uh, so i think that what happened uh, what happens traditionally can also be seen as as reflected in our partition of the indian subcontinent and in the recovery operation so while partition might you know uh, put all of us uh, in a tizzy when we see the numbers of people of women who were raped abducted killed but uh, the polygamous tendencies the desire to commodify women have always been there and as as i said that people like spivak uh, Uh, who are post colonial post modernist post structuralist in their approach they still find all of this french feminist ideas very very relevant in understanding political problems women face all over the world 
Então, so, uh, I'll give you an example of how the scheme of exchange, male desire, commodification of women looks like in a narrative of Manto. Now, this is a very brief sketch of written by Manto called Losing Proposition. Okay, first look at the title, which is shocking. Okay, Losing Proposition. Okay, we lost this proposition. Two friends finally picked out a girl from dozen. Uh, she cost 42 rupees, so obviously the commodity has a price. They brought her after spending the night. Uh, they asked her, what is your name? When she told him, uh, the boy the was taken aback, but he was told you were the other religion. They lied, she replied. Now look at the very, very curt, okay? Uh, almost object-like reply that the girl gives. They lied. Uh, oh, they cheated us, he screamed as he ran to his friend, selling us a girl from our own faith. Let's go and return her. So, so this is the transaction. Okay, this is how cold-blooded uh, the transaction is. Uh, you you brought the girl, but you brought the girl because she was a symbol of something. Okay, this commodity symbolizes something. And when you find that the commodity you've been cheated into getting it, you just go and return the commodity. Okay. Uh, there is also a short story called the Dutiful Daughter. Uh, now, the Dutiful Daughter. Uh, is perhaps uh, Manto's most direct, direct critique of the recovery uh, operation. Uh, and he says in The Dutiful Daughters that uh, what are we trying to do by recover women? Okay, I will quickly read uh, a very, very short paragraph where Manto makes fun of this whole recovery operation in the short story, Dutiful Daughter. Uh, why were they trying to rehabilitate the women? Who, ha who had been raped and taken away when they had led and taken away in the first place. It is very confusing to me. But when one still admired the devotion of the volunteers. So he's mocking the volunteers by saying that, look, what's the point in bringing them back and recovering them uh, and trying to restore the sense of honor when we already let them be, be raped and abducted. Uh, also, he notes that there were instances where women refused to come back from, from the place they were abducted in. For example, two abducted Muslim girls, he says, had refused to return to their parents who were in Pakistan. Uh, then there were stories of how women were giving touching, touching farewell by the abductor's family as if she was a daughter-in-law leaving on a long journey. So the human element, okay, uh, the woman's voice is completely lost in this very, very clinical process of recovery. Even if a woman is, is, is happy where she is, uh, she is not given a choice to choose where she wants to be. Uh, and in the short story, A Beautiful Daughter, Mando, in fact, uh, captures the story of a daughter who sees her mother and her family looking for her from camp to another. But she's happy with uh, a man of another faith and she does not go back. So, so these are the, the, the narratives through which Manto problematizes this, this, these schemes of exchange, as if you could exchange women like, like commodities. Okay, now another uh, concept uh, that, that Irigare gives us, again, critiquing psychoanalysis is of hysteria and mimicry. Uh, now, if you've uh, had some interest in psychoanalysis or you've read, uh, now, the word hysteria comes from the word hyster, okay, uh, which means womb, okay. And uh, since Greek times, uh, philosophers have speculated about uh, whether the uterus plagues women with a particular kind of, of disease, the wandering womb disease. So because of the, the anatomy and the, the body they are born into, women from Greek times have been assumed to be hysterical, okay. But what Irigare does is, uh, and, and this bias about women as hy hysterics or women as hysterical uh, is also seen in Freud and Lacan. Um, we also see this in our everyday uh, discourse, you know, uh, uh, that women are prone to crime, women are, are, are hysterical. So it's coming from a long uh, history of, of uh, bringing anatomy and uh, popular understanding together. Uh, so, for example, Freud also says that women are never active participants, you know. Uh, if a patient uh, 
seeks his pleasure actively as men do you 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 become obsessed it's called obsession but in case of women they experience it passively so all they have in their system is resistance disgust displeasure hysteria okay this is mostly the case with women so the whole problem with the domain like psych psychoanalysis is the passivity that it assigns to women both in terms of the bodily they lack uh, something and also at the level of desire and pleasure as though as though women are incapable of, of that now what irigare does is she turns this whole discourse of hysteria on its head okay and she uses hysteria as a form of mimicry now a very basic uh, definition of of mimicry is when you mimic you mime okay uh, you mimic something or or you imitate okay either to entertain or to ridicule now laka in fact says that mimicry can also be used for travesty for camouflaging for intimidation okay now after having trained herself in freudian and lacanian psychoanalysis having understood how freud says that women are vulnerable to hysteria to melancholy because uh, they don't have uh, have the phallus as as men do the little girl is always depressed because uh, she is she is uh, denied something by her anatomy okay so it is in this sense that that women are also prone to hysteria to melancholia now irigare is trained in all of this so what she does is she turns this whole understanding of hysteria on its head uh, uh, you might have heard of sisu's laugh of the medusa okay so so uh, the the whole evil potential of medusa the the connotation of being medusa is being played with by sisu in the laugh of the medusa okay my medusa laughs so be it there are other kinds of creative uh, potentials of medusa's laughter there is a sense of power and assertiveness in medusa's laughter now it is in the same strain that irigare also uses Uh, uh the discourse of mimicry and hysteria so when i say that that french feminists try to work from within they take these concepts that come from philosophy that come from psychoanalysis and they try to rework rework them okay um so as i said from i differ uh, that women are more prone to melancholia hysteria jealousy and what i see is that uh we also say that manto focused on women who were depressed or who were slightly neurotic uh but what i claim is that manto in fact revives uh, gives a chance to these neurotic women to break certain boundaries similar to what irigare does with the use of psychoanalysis okay so so the sick woman is not really sick or oppressed in the way we understand it in popular discourse but she is making a point she is mimicking the whole discourse so so, so suppose uh, i am assumed to be mad i i play along and i play with my madness i make a statement by playing along i mock the entire scheme which deems me mad okay i'm sure uh, 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 hamlet uh, makes an equally uh, interesting use of madness as a trope so does irigari but with irigare but with mimicry and and hysteria okay uh, so what what does this do? if you mimic the scheme if you mind what you are expected to be you generate irony and and instability uh, so as i said that there is nothing called a sexually neutral subject okay uh, uh, i'm sure you've heard of the symbolic order of of uh of laka okay uh, so everything begins with the little boy in in psychoanalysis uh, you enter language uh, when you enter the world of language you become a symbolic subject okay but when do women talk when have women written texts of philosophy or psychoanalysis okay uh, now in manto stories uh, there are a lot of apparently hysteric and deranged women but my claim is that these women are simply mimic protagonists okay uh, by playing along this this web of stigma and punishment they are exposing that very social structure that very scheme uh, to give an example of this i would briefly uh, read from a short story called a woman's life now mando is calling it a woman's life but the short story is essentially about 
uh, a prostitute. Uh, this prostitute is called Sagandhi. Okay. Uh, now Mantu will 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 etch a very very uh, a dingy scene of how this woman lives in a small room, uh, fighting with poor health, fighting with bad customers, uh, fighting with her own insecurities of living like a prostitute. Uh, it was a small room and uh, things were everywhere. Three or four ragged pairs of sandals lay under the bed. Uh, a mangy, sick dog lay sleeping with his head resting on them. Uh, so very, very dingy, dark room uh, in utter poverty. And Sogandhi is living in the middle of all this. Of course, she has uh, photos of all her gods uh, on the wall. Uh, and she also has uh, photos of some of her favorite men. Because for all her work as a prostitute, uh, Sogandhi is also... Uh, uh, a woman who in the end forgives and appreciates uh, appreciates uh, the men in her life, okay? So that's probably the hamartia of a prostitute uh, like Sogandhi. Now Sogandhi, of course, has uh, uh, a broker called Ram Lal and Ram Lal pays her a visit in the short story. Uh, and Ram Lal says that, look, uh, don't give your money whenever Madhu was expected from Pune. Sogandhi had to hit, hit, hit most of the money under her bed. This had first been suggested by Ram Lal, who knew that every th visit by Madhu was like a raid on Sogandhi's savings. Okay, so who is Madhu? Madhu is, uh, is uh, working in a police station in Pune, and uh, he's a regular customer of Sogandhi who works in Bombay. But each time Madhu uh, comes, he takes money from Sogandhi. Okay. So Ram Lal, who is the broker, and if I may use a fancy word like manager, he tells Sogandhi, please hide your money when your, your customer uh, Madhu comes. Now, now, this is deeply ironic that uh, a prostitute who's paid as, as a, a worker, as a commodity who's being used, in this case, is, is guilty of giving money away to a customer. So this is the, uh, the Achilles' heel or the weakness of a prostitute like like Sogandhi. Now, uh, of course, uh, Manto's portrayal of this prostitute is very, very humane. He talks about how when Sogandhi was a little girl, she used to hide herself in the big wooden chest which sat in a corner of her parents' home while other children looked for her. Uh, the fear of being caught mixed with a sense of excitement would make her heart beat very fast. The last five years had been like a game of hide and seek. She was either seeking or being sought. When a man said to her, I love you, Sogandhi, she would go weak in the knees. So Mando does not give you the, the, the cliched uh, story of how she became a prostitute, how she is being exploited. All she says is, Sogandhi craved for love. So if only somebody could tell her that, that look, I love you, that is enough for, for, for Sogandhi. So this man, Madhu, who worked as a police in Pune, would often come to her. But what would Madhu do? What Madhu would give her a false uh, sense of love. And also he would ask her to stop being a prostitute. Aren't you ashamed of selling yourself? Madhu would say. Putting a price on your body, 10 rupees you take. And then you turn into a prostitute. And what about me? I have come looking for something which really cannot be had. I need a woman, but do you need a man? Madhu made her feel like the police sergeant's chosen woman. He had also arranged everything in the room. So he would come, give her a lecture about not being a prostitute. Why can't you be my woman? Arrange her room and ultimately say, uh, Sogandhi, if you resume that old business of yours, I will never see you again. About this month's household expenses, the money will be on its way as soon as I get to Pune. So what did you say the monthly rent for this place was? So it is not that Madhu is trying to turn her from a prostitute into a wife, okay? What Madhu is doing is he's just playing into this, this desire for love that Sogandhi has. He's saying, stop doing this work, I'll send you money. But as we know, the money never comes. In fact, Sogandhi ends up giving him money. Now, I will, I will just cut the narrative short and tell you that one day in the middle of the night, Sogandhi is asked by her broker to go and stand in the middle of the road a very expensive car stops. Uh, the flashlight of, of the car uh, is put on Sogandhi's body and the customer looks at her. 
the male gaze uh, examines her and she is rejected okay uh, she has uh, she is unwell she is sick with fever she's come out to make some money which people like madhu will take away but she is rejected and she comes back home while she is lying down in the middle of the night there is a knock on her door and it is madhu who has come one more time now this is what madhu says at last you have done what i have always suggested take an early morning walk there is nothing like that for good health so madhu's uh, harangue you know of good behavior has started uh, so he tells okay you are just coming from somewhere and lying down you must have taken your morning walk um uh, sogandhi now has had a terrible experience and she uh, i cannot say she's a changed woman but something in her uh, is now uh, wide awake she she sits up in the bed and tells to madhu i was waiting for you today waiting he said a bit puzzled how did you know i was coming uh anyway he says oh the wise lovers hearts beat together and after you know sugar coating uh, some signs of affection uh, he starts telling sogandhi about how there is bad news i am in trouble there was this police investigation i botched up and i and unless i can get 20 or 30 rupees together and bribe my inspector i can say goodbye to my job now sogandhi is listening to this this whole building up of a new story one more time uh so madhu could smell liquor from sogandhi's breath so, so sogandhi has had a terrible experience after being rejected uh, in the middle of the night and she's drunk. 50 sogandhi said then she rose from the bed uh, and gave the money to to madhu uh, in the meantime she also got up and started looking at the pictures on the wall now as i said there are pictures of gods on one side and there are four pictures of of men she likes Uh, now one of those pictures is of madhu so after being examined in gaze at being the object of the male gaze sogandhi is now walking in her own room looking at the photographs one by one uh, sogandhi said then she began to laugh a light laugh like the first strain of summer madhu managed a smile with some difficulty and followed it with a forced guffaw uh so sogandhi is looking at each photo of the man she thinks she loves and she's laughing and criticizing them uh so she's pulling down the pictures one by one and saying what is he doing here no one with a mug like his is allowed on this wall is he madhu she asked madhu laughed but the sound was unnatural she pulled down the fourth picture a man in turban and then she pulled down madhu's photograph also so madhu is now getting worried because according to him sogandhi is behaving hysterical she's pulling down photographs and laughing like medusa well he says well done i did not like that photo of mine either so so, so sogandhi said you didn't like that one yeah well let me ask you is there anything about you which you should like this bulb of of a nose of yours the small hairy forehead your swollen nostrils your twisted ears and that awful breath your filthy unwashed body this oil that you coat yourself that you coat yourself with you didn't like your picture eh what is there to like about you now madhu starts flinching away from her look sogandhi it seems that to me that you have gone back to the dirty old profession i am telling you for the last time but now sogandhi has no patience for this this harangue from madhu sogandhi starts mimicking him yes yes if you return to that old business of yours that will be the end i'll drag you out by your hair as for your monthly expenses a money order will be on its way on its way soon from pune so this is sogandhi mocking mimicking laughing at madhu so madhu knows that his scheme has been exposed madhu listened in total dis- disbelief manto tells us Uh, sogandhi sogandhi madhu yelled it stings look at yourself sogandhi said your filthy cap and these rags they smell get out of my house so sogandhi has finally had enough of uh, of madhu's uh, uh, fake uh, sympathies and attempts to turn her into uh, a quote and quote proper woman sogandhi madhu kept sk- screaming but sogandhi said you creep why do you come here am i your mother who will give you money to spend uh, you dog you wretch so on and so forth but 
I know as soon as you get to Pune, you will money order me the money. So with this mocking of this entire strategy, Madhu is pushed out of the house. For a long time, Sogandi sat in the chair. Then she rose, picked up her dog from the floor, put the dog carefully on the bed, laid herself next to him, threw an arm across the dog's wasted body, and went to sleep. Uh, so this is how, uh, you know, uh, the hysterical laughter, the mimicking. Okay. You you think I'm a, I'm a sick woman I'm a fallen woman I'll enact that uh, you pretend you will give me money and rescue me I don't need your rescue so Manto's story a woman's life uh, plays on all those all those metaphors of 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 hysteria and mimicry now the third aspect from Irigare which I borrow uh, apart from libidinal economy and women being exchanged women being hysterical is the whole question of civic identity. Do women have a civic identity? Now, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Partha Chatterjee and the essay nationalist resolution of the women's question. So I will not go into the details of it. But the term new woman is very, very interesting and very, very important to the uh, nationalist movement that happened in the Indian subcontinent. Okay. So what happens when the traditional woman becomes the new woman? A new kind of code of conduct, a new kind of gender discourse has to be developed in order to make sure that women transition from the traditional to new in the right way, in the way hired by the nation. For example, uh, there are writers like Madhu Kishwar, Anand, who will tell you that, uh, that Gandhi, who kind of guided uh, the population into participating, in the national movement was also uh, very careful uh, that that women knew that Sita, Damianti, Draupadi, these were the ideals of womenhood they had to look up to. So, while you have come from the inside uh, outside, now in the public sphere, please remember that gentleness, being a delicate flower, you know, your moral center uh, should be intact, like you see these great women, Sita, Savitri, so on and so forth. Uh, similarly, as I said, there is a dichotomy of the spiritual and the material, okay? So the spiritual was the inside of the house, the material is what men chase, chase outside. Of course, I'm, I'm diluting a lot of this discourse, which is uh, freely available and known to, to a lot of us. The other important point that, that was made at that time was the collating of the role of the wife and the sister. Okay, so, so you dedicate yourself to the cause of the nation. And this is, of course, applicable to both the genders. And uh, you live the right life contributing to uh, the birth of the nation and, and nothing else. Okay, so as I said, this construction of the new woman is a new project. Uh, along with the construction of the new nation. So this is central to defeating the colonizer also. Our women are not really uh, westernized women. They are true to their spiritual uh, religious core. Okay, so this is, this is the contemporary. So as I said, uh, that uh, uh, feminists from India always, always will insist that before crossing over to to a Western framework, we must historicize, okay? We must contextualize what we are talking about to the historical and political context. So when I say I'm going to uh, play with this crossing over of Manto to uh, a French feminist framework, I'm also ensuring that what, what we are discussing uh, has the backing of the history and the socio-political development of the time. So. So when you see this happening on the ground, you know, a new discourse to regulate women's behavior was already in place. You will see how it also maps onto Manto's uh, short story. Okay, so we've already discussed about how uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, discourses have distributed gender roles, okay, where women are essentially uh, just symbols, okay. In that sense, women have no autonomy. Uh, so, so if, if, if the political realm, like when I said the inner and the outer, who does the outer belong to? Men have mastered the material world. Women have preserved the core values, the hearth, the center of the home. So those are the distributed uh, roles. 
Now, uh, I'm sure uh, some of you might have heard of Antigone. Uh, she is uh, the focus of Sophocles' play uh, from the Greek times. Uh, and Antigone's tragedy, apart from being many other things, uh, I'm sure you know that Antigone tried giving a burial to her brother Polynices uh, against the wishes of the King Creon. Okay, Antigone was the daughter of Oedipus. Now, without going too much into the history of Antigone, uh, Antigone is also uh, seen as somebody who's struggling to find a civic identity. So what she does is she tries to give burial to her brother who has been a traitor to the state. So the king does not give a, an honorable burial to, uh, to Polynices, but Antigone wants to preserve the familial law, the bond between the, the brother and the daughter and uh, brother and the sister. And she says, I will give a burial to uh, my brother and secretly she goes and tries to uh, bury him under some dust okay so this is how uh, women have always tried to 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 counter uh, some of the laws of the state but antigone according to irigare remains somebody who's on the outside of the state she does not have a have a civic identity uh, and as we discussed earlier that women in any case uh, have been absent from the discourse of, of nation building, uh, nationalism, etc., social political reforms. So even if you think of our national movement, there are very few women and also women who were uh, really from the intellectual class or from powerful families who could come to the fore. Uh, okay, uh, so the whole point that Irigare tries to make is women exist within the scheme of men. This, as you can see, is already an extension of the libidinal economy analogy that women exist as products to appease, to bond, to maintain the homosocial order. Okay, so women do not exist by themselves as subjects, uh, but they remain as 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 objects to be used by by men. Now, uh, this whole focus on celibacy, this whole focus on on, uh, on uh, you know, wives uh, helping you as sisters. There are terms like, you know, sahadharmini and ardhangini, okay? So ardhangini is your better half. Sahadharmini is somebody who will, who will participate in your, in your dharma or in your, in your work, okay? So those are the terms that were handed down to the, to the new woman. Now, there's a very interesting story of Manto called The Price of Freedom. Uh, and the price of freedom literally uh, is about the price a young couple has to, play, has to pay in order to be active contributors to the nationalist movement, okay? So uh, the protagonist of the story is, is a man called Gulam Ali. Interestingly, in this story, Manto remains uh, as Manto. So he retains his identity as Saadat Hassan. He is not uh, taking up an artificial narrative voice. So what Manto does in this short story is he shows how Ghulam Ali is, is, is called Shehzada. He is the new young political leader on the block. And the, the entire uh, uh, story unfolds as a result of the Jallianwala Bagh movement. So the Congress is very active. Uh, they are planning a new set of protests after the Jallianwala Bagh movement. And uh, the whole uh, story unfolds in Amritsar. So what happens is uh, this protagonist, Gulam Ali, uh, he is a Kashmiri Muslim. He is the new uh, young worker on the Congress's uh, stage. And they give him this title of Shehzada. Of course, Manto in his typical fashion mocks the word Shehzada with, with you know, uh, the title of the dictator. Uh, so he's, he's mocking the, the terminology of power. There is also a spiritual figure in the short story called Babaji. Now, Babaji is like a spiritual mentor of, of the group, uh, the, the group of workers who are, uh, who are planning this agitation in Amritsar. The, the interesting part of the story is that Ghulam Ali falls in love with the Hindu woman called Nigar. And Nigar is also uh, a nurse at the local women's hospital. So very, very typically uh, feminine uh, responsibilities granted to the women Nigar. But Nigar also wants to serve the country and uh, as encouraged by the leaders of the time, she wants to join the nationalist movement. So 
what is happening is uh, from uh, there is a slight distinction which sociologists have made between the woman of the street and the woman on the street okay now what do i mean by the woman of the street the woman of the street is the woman who who lives by surviving who survives by virtue of living on the street okay the prostitute who stands on the street who makes her living by being on the on the outside that's the woman of the street but uh, the nationalist discourse tried to distinguish this woman from the woman on the street who is the woman on the street the women who were inside the house women like nigar who are nurses who are pious women who are daughters housewives there is a need to distinguish between the prostitutes the destitute women who have always been on the street and the new woman who now wants to come on the street and protest against the british so what manto is pointing out here is an anxiety on part of of our leaders to maintain this fine line that look just because women like nigar or are on the street it does not mean that they are women of the street so so uh, the point to appreciate here is the way manto was aware of all these discourses uh, weaves them into his short story and obviously mocks mocks them with his uh, satirical humor so as i said nigar is the embodiment of the new woman she works for the nation but worships her man who is gulam ali uh, now what happens is uh, they get married uh, in the in the party headquarters uh, uh, their their ceremony is a blend of hindu and muslim rituals and they take blessing from baba ji uh, but baba ji of course says uh, why do you people want to marry gulam ali did not hesitate and says because we are committed to the cause as we are committed to the freedom of india and while circumstances may change the timing of that event it is final and immutable so he wishes to marry her uh, marry nigar as he wishes to have independence for the country okay whenever that that is going to happen so the marriage is solemnized by the blessings of baba ji but baba ji also says uh, and this is very important and resonates uh, the censorship that women faced the true purpose of marriage is comradeship what is being sanctified today will serve the cause of india's freedom a true marriage should be free of lust and those who are able to to exorcise this evil from their lives deserve our respect okay uh, so essentially the idea is you live like an ardhangini ta dharmini uh, uh, you are a comrade and a sister more than uh, you being you being a wife so so after this marriage happens manto says he leaves amritsar and after 8 years bumps into gulam ali in bombay okay he is surprised to see gulam ali uh, the one time popular leader uh, working in the, in the young party now he is in bombay and he sees gulam ali in a in a shop in a shoe store okay but interestingly uh, gulam ali uh, has has a, a kid and uh, uh, when he bumps into manto manto asks him what happened uh, gulam ali says i could not i could not take it anymore uh, i loved my wife i wanted uh, to live like a happy man i wanted to have children i wanted to live a complete life so after a point i quit the nationalist uh, struggle because because i could not really look at uh, my wife's struggle she wanted to enjoy motherhood she wanted to have a family of her own so so this dichotomy you know that you can either be uh, be uh, spiritual or you could be uh, be nationalist or you could be material or you could be carnal all these boundaries are blurred by manto in in critiquing the episodes in stories like price of freedom where gulam ali ultimately ultimately gives up and runs away to bombay okay so he does not want a life of of abstinence anymore and also interestingly uh, there are no uh, uh, rubber shoes available in his shoe store uh, so the sight of rubber is 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 dreadful uh, to him now the final uh, concept that i want to uh, borrow from uh, irgare as well as puko is is this whole point about how to bring universal change is it possible uh, to look at the idea of society nation knowledge from an alternate point of view today 
Now, as I said, Irigare is not simply a feminist or a philosopher. She's also an activist. She's also a trainer. Okay. So, uh, in fact, she's been invited by UN, by many other countries to come and draft policies uh, for them. And uh, as you can see, she says that, you know, uh, violence uh, stemming from patriarchy has done a lot of damage. Uh, she analyzes the Chernobyl nuclear accident, legends of the Greek times, even documents like the, like the United Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so she says that, that there is no neutral subject. We keep talking about, about a neutral he, but there is no neutral he. There must be two subjects, as I, as I stated before. Uh, also, uh, as I told you, in case of philosophy or even in, in writing and literature, we never really question the identity and positioning of the form giving subject. Who is creating this? Who is generating this discourse? Uh, what is the gender? Uh, what is the positioning? What is the identity of, of the person who has created a particular discourse? So we never speak of, of these things. Uh, we take the written word as it is. We take our legal political documents as they are. And then we, we make arrange, uh, amendments to sensitize. But who has created these documents, we never question. Uh, similarly, she says that, you know, uh, science is supposed to be neutral. But, but, but as we know, there is nothing called, called a neutral uh, uh, voice. Now, somebody who echoes uh, a similar idea of how our discourses are biased is Michel Foucault. Okay. Uh, particularly in the work, The Order of Discourse. Now, he says that there are three particular systems of exclusions, uh, which means there are three particular ways in which our discourse is created by excluding other things, okay? The first strategy is forbidden speech. The second strategy is this whole discourse of madness. And the third strategy is, is this whole idea of truth with a capital T, okay? As, as if truth is sacrosanct and out there. Uh, now, what does he mean by all this? For example, the right to speak, the object of speech, the speaking subject, they are all regulated to formulate discourses, okay? So, so as we know, no discourse exists in isolation. Uh, and each discourse is a product of power, be it religion, be it politics, uh, be it United Nations documents, there is power involved in how each of these are etched, okay? Uh, so Foucault says that, that you know, uh, forbidding some people from speaking uh, or, or, or using the, the, the whole uh, trope of madness, okay? Or making truth appear as something sacred with a capital T. These help those in power in shaping a particular kind, kind of discourse. Now, uh, he says that, uh, so Judith Butler, for example, makes use of, of some of these ideas and says that nobody exists in isolation. The self is a product of, of discursive strategy. Uh, for example, uh, Butler has spoken of something called performative language. Language is a performance. So when I say I'm swearing, okay, when I swear, I turn from... Uh, from a normal human being to uh, to a witness in a court case or when i swear i turn from a regular human being into into a, a political minister okay so language is nothing but performance and our language comes from those who are in power uh, so similarly women's manuals you know women should should read these conduct books uh, foucault has written a lot about about 18th century Victorian era uh, regulation on women's bodies and, uh, and those things. Uh, now, talking about India, uh, writers in books like Other Side of Silence, Borders and Boundaries have said that we should encourage the use of memory and personal narratives for understanding the politics of, of the time. Uh, again, uh, Iri Gare has, has gone on talking about how violence, consumerism, religious bigotry, death, even ecological instability. All of this comes from our hunger to power and uh, is also in some sense related uh, to this urge for, for control. Now, please note that Erigade does not say that you should replace the masculine 
with the feminine okay it does not mean a mere replacement of one with the other it rather stands for equal access for both sexes to human dignity so when i say she conducts uh, you know training for citizenship in places all over the world including in italy she is only telling the civic society that let's give dignity voice Uh, a narrative to both the sexes it does not at all talk about replacing one with the other which will again be tantamount to the same course of, of power that has existed for so long she also says that when we talk about progress peace social justice weapons conflicts we think of them as neutral concepts detached from uh, space and time but this is not true okay uh, you cannot talk about weapons in isolation okay weapons always come with a with a context all this is very very relevant for manto also there are letters which manto has written to the um, to the us where he talks about hiroshima nagasaki he says that you know uncle sam it's very easy for you to manufacture a bomb so please manufacture a bomb and distribute to everyone including to india and pakistan of course he's mocking the idea being that that you know uh, essentially you are weaponizing okay and it is causing a lot of damage to to those who are already on the margins whether on the margins of their own society or of 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 the global uh, landscape okay uh, and also we have a tendency to get away by saying that this episode of violence was collective psychosis or cynicism this i mentioned in case of partition also how we think of these episodes of violence as aberration or oh, the entire uh, society went mad the entire society Uh, uh, lost its mind. Irigaray says that that's not the case. It's only a discourse constructed to maintain status quo. Okay, so all that she's saying is whether we are talking about our, our civic documents, our UN documents, uh, our charters, our peace treaties, we need to decode the language because everything is contributing to structures of power. Okay, uh, and the whole idea is we should bring back. Uh, uh more of the feminine okay now again feminine does not mean uh more women though it should also mean more women but what it also means is an alternate way of thinking that has not existed before okay the sheer neglect of 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 women and children from the consequences of political warfare for example uh so what happens to those agents are they not stakeholders are they not subjects okay so that is the kind of perspective she wants to bring in not to ignore the fact that the maternal means means you want to regenerate you want to nourish rather than you, you want to uh, you want to destroy so as i said with most french feminists the lines between the civic the theoretical the political the scientific the creative are extremely blurred okay so uh, while kristeva or sizu talks about madness they are also building theory in the in the process now i will conclude uh, this section about how uh, there is a need to to think beyond structures of power structures of nation okay uh, by a very very famous uh, short story of manto called toba takes thing okay and how uh, the trope of madness here is employed uh, and linked with the bodily and with the spatial okay so toba takes thing those of you who might have read is perhaps the most celebrated of manto's short story but there is nobody in in the story called toba takes sing that's the interesting part the protagonist in the short story is a sick old man uh, a sick old man called bishan singh okay but somehow uh, bishan singh who is in a mental asylum gradually loses his own identity in the name of an imaginary place called toba takes sing so as i said fuko is saying mag madness is used for exclusion but sometimes the madman gives you more profound truths okay his his censured his silenced voice is in fact a voice that wants to claim the body politic as his own because he's been excluded like women like slaves okay uh, so again irigare is saying that this war like method of organizing society is not self evident so when i say that you know uh, it, according to irigare we have organized our society in a war like method uh you will say no where is the war i don't see that so she is mentioning the exact point that this is not self evident 
uh, but it has a sex okay and but the age of technology has given wep given weapons a power that exceeds the conflict and risks uh, taken among patriarchs okay there is a lot of physical and mental aggression involved in the way we interact not just personally but also globally and you will find this very very uh, relevant today with whatever is ha is happening uh, so there is a need for an overall cultural transformation inclusion of women as genuinely responsible subjects to uh, to to bring sex specific cultural and political ethics now i find lots of similarities between manto and the protagonist he created in in bishan singh who is the center of the short story toba takes singh now manto literally uh, lost his everything when he was taken uh, from bombay to lahore he went somewhat voluntarily but of course compelled by the violence he saw happening around him so manto witnessed violence death first hand all this is captured in some of his short stories uh, and he says that you know uh, what manto wrote is also a lot of gibberish is a lot of nonsense to many people for example uh, bishan singh says man is either man or he is a donkey a house a table or something else okay so the entire short story is full of such uh such gibberish which is the language of the madman but you will see that the madman also asks a lot of questions which uh, many sane people are not asking uh, so one uh, one common line that that bishan uh, singh keeps repeating in the short story and he is a madman in a mental asylum is uh, is upar de gurgur de anex de be de thyana the moong the dal of the government of pakistan so this is the line he keeps repeating because he is lived in pakistan all his life so now with recovery operation the two governments have decided that we are separate nations our mad people should also be brought back to india and muslim mad people should be given back to pakistan now bishan singh is saying despite being mad uh, look at what bishan singh says and a lot of other mad people say uh most of the inmates appeared to be dead against the entire operation they simply could not understand why they were being forcibly removed from this place uh, one of the problems they had was where was pakistan now so suddenly everybody had to go from pakistan to india and india to pakistan however nobody knew where exactly pakistan was because this is a new this is a new coinage uh, so you see they are asking questions like uh, why is it uh, where is this pakistan where is this toba takes singh is pakistan in india or is india in pakistan in india no in pakistan upar de gurgur the annex the bay the tiana so on and so forth okay uh, so uh, the question that nobody is asking is how come just by change of nomenclature people have to now change their home their identity their sense of what they have called their place their abode okay uh, so bishan singh despite being a sikh he also mentions the point that that he i am not going to uh, india because i don't know india i have lived only here i am not going to pakistan because i don't know pakistan i have only lived here so his sense of place is the immediate okay Uh, and ultimately what happened is they are taken to the border they are exchanged but bishan singh refused to go and he ultimately takes refuge on the border of the two countries naming that place an imaginary place toba takes singh uh, this is toba takes singh he announced at the line dividing india however he wouldn't move upar de gurgur the annex the bay the dhyana the moong the dal of toba takes singh there he stood in no man's land on his swollen legs like a colossus just before sunrise bishan singh the man who had stood on his legs for 15 years screamed and collapsed as officials from two sides rushed towards him there behind barbed wires on one side lay india and behind more barbed wires on the other side lay pakistan in between on a bit of earth which had no name lay toba takes singh so bishan singh and toba takes singh have become one as manto and bombay had become one so manto was attached to bombay not because bombay was a place in india or in pakistan but because bombay was the only place he knew so look at the way 
the body is used to symbolize the place but this place does not really belong to to any nation okay um, so as i said he is mantu and vishnu singh are themselves uh, interrelated themselves uh, depicted as mad men who were perhaps wiser than anybody around them mantu today is 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 celebrated as a visionary but look at the way he laments about bombay that that piece of land had offered me shelter i will never be able to live anywhere else you may leave or you may stay okay so this is almost like vishan singh saying i am not going to go anywhere okay uh, so i will conclude by by just reading this little bit from irigare and she says that uh, the man who risks his life uh, risks everything but he is the man who's truly walking towards the abyss towards the truth their senses awake they boldly go forward by ways where others do not they go forward and sometimes a song comes uh, to their mouth okay so uh, uh, only the inspiration that will strike the other with feelings and thoughts that pour out of them but who hears it so nobody hears the madman obscurely their song what is the world of today of yesterday the necessity of a destiny which is never heard clearly never appears in broad daylight so on and so forth so the whole point here is that manto is is the lonely figure but not really the aloof figure uh, he is he is the madman like vishan singh but the madman who probably could see the structures of power out of which uh, all our discourses are born and in take, in taking this leap you know of taking manto to the world of irigare my only attempt was to see that can we do so, can we do something more with manto can we can we take him outside this limiting straight jacket of violence and and and, and partition events can we make him uh, you know something more complex probably a little post modernist uh, so that's what i have tried to do in in playing with with this uh, this whole uh, presentation and i think uh, uh i will stop there thank you okay thank you ma'am uh, it's now time to move on to our question and answer section so me and dan would be simultaneously reading questions from both the zoom and youtube platform yeah well one second nina yes sir nina can i have a question can i have a quick word with prof tiwari that's all right yeah all right okay so thank you ma'am for that quite you know elaborate and interesting insightful session into the writings of manto um i wanted to have a quick word because part because this is not particularly a question it's part commentary and part question and also because this is a question that i frequently have discussions on in our own classes i'm a teacher here at sb college as well and this is a question that we frequently encounter in our classes so maybe if we can talk to the students maybe we can have a greater meaning so you maintain that uh, that despite the political turbulence of the times that monto lived and wrote in the, the independence the pre independence times and so on uh, so even though times were deeply political his writings are somewhat apolitical at least with respect to definitions of politics in its narrow nationalistic sense and apparently it is this aspect of his writings this imaginatively apolitical that makes his writings necessarily feminine i guess that's the general gist that i got uh you, you want me to you want me to add to that or or uh, explain uh, maybe that I, maybe i'll complete my series of uh, observations and uh, yeah so this is the general gist that i got that uh, that it's this aspect of his writings which is kind of imaginative and apolitical that makes his writings necessarily somewhat feminine but if that's the case uh, well don't you think we run the risk of essentializing gendered writings because particularly in his dis distinction of you know the masculine and the symbolic on the one hand and then the uh, you know the the feminine and the imaginative and the semiotic on the other hand so i guess my question is maybe I, maybe i'll divide my question into three parts so should we essentialize these notions of feminine and masculine or like you know like how you pointed out towards the end of your talk should we go for more postmodern formulations of understanding gender but the problem i understand there is that that opens up a whole new can of worms because how do you reconcile these apparent contradictions because I, in some sense i think i saw that in the presentation as well because on the one hand feminist scholarship has been obsessed with uh with with doing away with these allegations these accusations of 
interpreting the feminine as hysteric but at the same time we are also struggling with you know even though we are struggling with that kind of accusations of hysteria we are also identifying manto's writings as feminine because you know because it's somewhat hysteric itself and as a last point maybe i should also refer to the recent debate that we are having uh, surrounding zomato's a plan to grant its female employees paid menstrual leave and there was a very very interesting debate on this issue by two of these you know primary prominent feminine activists i think one of them was barkhadat i forget the name of the second person but maybe you are aware of this debate in which when somato offered its female employees paid menstrual leave i think barkhadat fiercely opposed it she called it a very regressive kind of a move whereas her counterpart uh, who is also a very prominent feminist scholar she said that no it's something that we desperately need so how do you reconcile these apparent uh, contradictions okay uh, uh, sorry i did not get your name if you could repeat your uh, name yeah my name is vimal i teach in this department of english at sp okay. college thanks uh, thanks a lot for your question uh, though you know uh, uh, yeah they are they are questions and they are also interesting points of discussion uh uh first of all i would not uh, solely take upon myself this very very uh, challenging job of reconciling uh, different debates that have always existed within feminist thought so it is not possible uh, uh, for any one of us me included to offer any uh, easy uh, reconciliation of these questions that as you point out from the zomato controversy have always existed uh, the zomato controversy is just one more manifestation of the fact that uh, uh, that are we uh, looking at women are we looking at sexualized bodies are we looking at gender uh, uh, what are women saying about, what is the idea of women's progress so on and so forth uh, so so let me just start first by starting where you started uh, i did not mention that manto was apolitical uh, what i mentioned was uh, that there is a popular opinion that manto was an aloof writer see the word politics come from polis uh, the, the 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 greek idea of the city states okay so uh, anything happening in the polis was politics uh, so politics in that sense is everyday business so i i in fact endorse that notion of of understanding politics with regard to manto that you know uh, what manto was perhaps opposed to was polemics uh, he found it very difficult to take strict sides and you know uh, call himself uh, a progressive or or something else but i did not at all imply that manto was not political manto was political in the sense that whatever was happening around him the business of the society the country the polis was his business so in that sense he was very much political i i don't think i conveyed uh, it maybe the, uh, i did not convey it properly but my intention was to say that uh he is not really aloof he is not really cut off and when i talk about uh, the way he talks about the us uh, hiroshima nagasaki the bathing beauty uh, posters in hollywood uh, he is very much aware of of gender and political and global issues of his time uh so manto is not polemical but definitely political uh, i hope i hope that point uh, uh, point is 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 addressed now coming to your uh, points which are uh, you are raising have um, always well, if, if, well, in one, the one quick second if, if you because i guess we uh, got the question wrong because when i said he was there is a sense that he was being a political what i meant was that perhaps there is commentary that even though he lived in sufficiently politically turbulent times that is not necessarily reflected in his writing his writing is concerned more towards you know what you identified as the imaginative and the feminine part rather than the overtly political part that's what i meant by you know in the narrow sense of the word political not in the broad sense yeah so 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 to to that point uh, what i will say is that uh, uh, i don't want to reduce manto's politics to only the politics of the division of the subcontinent uh, the attempt of my presentation was to probably explore Uh, other strands of thought that are equally powerful but not so much highlighted uh, but that uh, still should not take away from the fact that a lot of partition uh, and nation building violence did find itself into manto's uh, writing uh, so everything exists but my presentation uh, wanted to highlight something else about manto's writing which does not really uh, get discussed so much 
so that was all that i was intending to do regarding your point about about essentialism uh, irigare herself uh, like most french feminists uh, has been often asked if 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 you know if in talking about uh, about women and men she is she is in fact in some sense guilty of of essentializing you know uh, having these very very strict strict gender boundaries uh, but then you know uh, this this question can be asked uh, 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 to you and me as well this question can be asked to uh, to any feminist uh, so so there are two things here one is ecriture femini which is uh, female writing uh, that they try to create they do not exclude men uh, as in you know men as a sex from that process okay all they are talking about is is the posi positioning of the form giving subject how is the form giving subject view, viewing our universe our culture our present day politics so it's not so much about the body as about the positioning of the subject in a particular discourse uh, for example as i said sidhu says kafka is a very good writer uh, she identifies a potential for crossing over from a uh, uh, a male centric universe uh, to the alterity as it were so uh, i don't think this kind of writing if you identify the feminine potential necessarily means you are essentializing ways of thinking to to particular bodies uh, otherwise we will again be doing anatomy is destiny uh, so when i say female writing the feminine in manto i am just talking about the way manto has a very very different take on creativity i don't know how many indian writers at that time thought that you know uh the the birth of a new society is like a cesarean operation me writing something new is is like me laying eggs okay uh, uh so i am only borrowing that those those metaphors and that alternate approach to acknowledging that look uh the male subject is not the only subject there are two okay uh so so this approach can come from from any uh, writer irrespective of the of the, of the of the anatomy or of the sex uh as as i claim i see the potential uh in manto uh, also people like butler uh talk about performativity okay so uh, we all know the the age old definition when we are asked what is gender we say we say gender is a social performance so i think uh, my understanding of uh, of what irigaret is trying to do is two pronged uh, one as an activist as a thinker as a trainer of civil society she is actually pushing for the inclusion of of more women uh, which is a fair thing to do uh, because we see that people like jacinda ardern have brought a lot of change in countries like new zealand uh, almost revamping uh, a whole new way of looking at economy and growth okay uh, not not gdp driven so on and so forth so on the one hand as an activist today she is trying to bring actually more more women and more gender equality on the ground and please remember this is the third phase of irigare's career in the first phase she pointed out the problems with philosophy with psychoanalysis in the second phase she started rewriting some of these and now in the third phase of her career irigare is trying to be an activist on the ground so so what you are asking is is all uh, present in feminist debate if you just pick up uh, pick up any debate these questions have have been asked all along all i can say is on the one hand irigare is promoting more more women so that we have inclusive governance uh, inclusive leadership inclusive civic documents participation and on the other she is saying let's also revisit what exists as knowledge uh, you know as wisdom uh, so so i don't really have any uh, you know uh, easy answer to give you except that each time she is talk she is asked about uh, essentialism she says uh that i am talking about sexual difference uh, i am not saying that uh, those born with a male anatomy should be replaced by a female anatomy or so on and so forth but we should have sexuate rights so men and women are equal and different and let's have a world where we have both subjecthood reflected in policy making so on and so forth uh i don't know i, I have kind of meandered into into explaining to you that these anxieties about essentializing have always been there that is why i pick i don't really push this whole thing that you know if you are 
if you are uh, a woman if you are uh, talking about reproduction fluidity if you understand uh, the mother's body only then can you produce writing that sees from another perspective mantu can also see from that that other perspective is 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 what is what what i was trying to say uh, and uh, i mean there are all kinds of debate i don't want to to discuss much about the the zomato uh, controversy other than the fact that uh, that even all women are not feminists and uh, all women don't think of uh, of uh, feminism as a well defined cause they should participate in but i'm sure we uh, i'm sure most women have their uh, everyday gender struggles and from that uh, you know their opinion of of what's right and what's wrong is born but at the same time we we do need uh, we do need access to laws uh, we do need access to leaves Uh, we do need access to uh, uh, to constitutional uh, provisions which kind of ensure that uh, the rights of all say all genders are are factored in that, that's that's what i would say i i don't really have much to to say about barkha that's uh, so i'll i'll leave it there thank, yeah thank you ma'am we have a question from uh, gunjan chaturvedi can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay and the question is can you present a comparison between mantu's femininity and ismat chutais uh mantu's uh, uh, sh- so should i should i compare uh, uh, i don't know if 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 it's uh, if it's good to compare or if it is it is necessary to compare or gunjan just wants me to to generally discuss uh, uh, mantu and chukta so chukta a lot of us are aware of of the short story lihaf uh, I- i'm sure some of you might have have heard of of lihaf so so uh, there are similarities of course there is a certain uh, provocative strand to both uh, mantu and chukta chukta does not uh, shy away from writing things that can be provocative that can be disturbing in fact in that sense they were pretty much uh, soul brother and, and sister uh, extremely bold in their articulation of female sexuality as well but i don't really know if it's if it's so so lihaf uh, uh, hints at lesbianism and and uh, uh, a different kind of bond between women uh, there are stories like these in mantu also uh but not that directly uh, and boldly etched uh but i don't know if it's a fair thing to compare but what i will compare is the fact that uh that that the chukte uh, and mantu uh, were greatly inspired from each other and they had uh, a lot of conflict also they would they would pull each other's leg they would give uh, creative feedback to each other's writing so i don't know if there is much to much to compare uh chuktai has a style uh, has a style of her own uh, and uh, pro- probably uh, a slightly different take uh, she is uh, her politics is different compared from from mantos politics but i don't really uh, know whether it's fair to compare uh, manto and Chik- chuktai's uh, stories like you know to, uh, to what end unless we have a framework uh, in mind you know along which we we need to compare otherwise you know both of them have really provided us bold uh, bold women figures and were way way ahead of their time uh, uh, of course faced uh, a lot of censorship also because of what they what they wrote uh, so i see a lot of similarities in fact between chuktai and mantu yeah thank you ma'am uh, our next question is for mr joy elvin uh, mantu was known to write about the hard truths of society that no one dared to talk about did society in those days accept such writings uh no no certainly not and uh, in fact uh, 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 something as uh, st- uh, you know stern as being charged of pornography uh, uh, happened uh, to manto uh, manto was uh, in fact uh, brought to court uh, several times uh, both in india and in pakistan Uh, because some of his writing uh, was deemed as 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 pornographic so sometimes his depiction of partition violence uh, uh, was so brutal uh, that that it really irked people and they charged uh, charged him of of pornography more than that uh, as i mentioned earlier he did not want to join one band of 
of political thinkers or one band of writers so that really left left him isolated for example a lot of writers from the progressive writers movement ended up bashing manto for uh, for not joining hands so uh, so as far as the society is concerned whether it's the legal system or it's the community of writers manto had to face a lot of flack from everyone for for not appearing to be clear in his political uh, political ideology uh, yeah so his struggles were very much real and after going to lahore he he hardly found uh, any work so so yeah he paid a price for writing those those brutal things thank you ma'am ma'am the next question is from mantri venkata raghuram manto was often the center of pure versus perverse literature in pakistani writing would cure theory be a better tool to understand manto than canonizing him under feminism okay uh first of all there are overlaps uh, uh intersectional alignments between queer theory and feminism also uh, a lot of french feminists identify themselves as queer uh, so i i actually don't see the necessity to compartmentalize this also that you can either uh, do feminist theory or you can do queer theory uh, uh, so so uh, and and of course irigare is known as a feminist Uh, but my interest here was to identify uh, feminine strands of thinking in manto uh, and uh, many people have already termed uh, manto's writing as as women centric uh, a feminist analysis of manto has been happening since ages but i think uh, what i tried to do by, by exploring the feminine in him was was to let him talk about men and women Uh, uh so a toba take sing a bishan sing and a toba take sing uh does an equally uh, radical job of questioning national boundaries as does uh, uh the dutiful daughter who does not want to go back uh, to home and be recovered uh so when i say i am doing a feminist reading of manto it is not in contradiction uh with uh, the possibilities of doing queer readings of manto uh and there is no pure or 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 perverse manto kind of finds pure truth in perverse situations so those lines are absolutely blurred in manto some of his stories can be read from lgbtq queer theory perspective uh and what i did was uh, provide a, a a feminine way of exploring his writing where both men and women become agents of of you know questioning the system as it exists whether it's bishan singh or sogandhi or the dutiful daughter so there so so there is a wide spectrum with which you can approach manto uh, mine was just one attempt uh, to explore his uh, his oeuvre so uh, yeah i mean queer theory uh, uh, is is absolutely rich and 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 not at all in contradiction with a lot of feminist agenda that that we study in manto thank you ma'am Our next question is from Manjula S. How far do you think the feministic literature have passed the message to the mainstream society to accommodate women as constructive contributors to the realm of nation building, rather than simply getting labeled either as women on the street or as women on the street? Okay. Uh, so uh, obviously, we have come a long way from. Uh, from the 1940s and 50s uh, luckily a lot of us are already uh, women on the street whether you are going to college uh, to study or you are going to the university to teach or you are a barkha that uh, reporting uh, from the streets of different uh, uh, cities so i don't think that kind of divide uh, exists in the in the sense that it existed back then uh, but uh, you know uh, i mean we all know as as academics and researchers that uh, uh, there is a need to discuss things in academia and outside uh, outside academia uh, uh, so so while feminist theory might have been born within the corridors of you know uh, offices and and halo chambers of of our uh, universities uh, in india and abroad Uh, there are a lot of women out there who don't even know uh, feminist theory and are 
far more conscious of of their uh, feminist uh, engagements and the need for gender change than we are uh, so uh, so all that we can do uh, all that feminist theory can do is probably to uh, to you know align itself more with 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 activism out there there are women in villages who who are doing a lot of radical work with regard to gender change and we don't even call them feminist so uh, with or without our reservations uh, about the term feminist gender change uh, need for gender change is uh, is a responsibility for all of us as uh, as uh, educated human beings and uh, i don't think the label of the or the biases towards the the word feminist which according to me is not uh, a pejorative term at all should limit our responsibility or our awareness to the fact that there is a need to bring equality still in our uh, in our world uh, so and since women all over the world are doing great as leaders i think uh, we are already seeing uh, uh, a change i don't know if that answers your question but all i'm saying is that uh, that at least now we should not have these watertight compartments that okay this is academic writing and you know uh, patriarchy is is somewhere still in our homes so thank you ma'am uh, there are a lot of wonderful questions more than 50 questions have come but the problem is we are running out of time so we just have time for one more question it's from samreen fatima ma'am how would you define identity and the concept of self versus other in reference to your title the feminine mantra how would i define identity uh, and uh, could you repeat the the question one more time how would you define identity and the concept of self versus other okay uh, so uh, uh, and this was asked by fatima i, I assume um, uh, so, so fatima these are are very broad terms uh, identity self and the other i'm sure uh, you've come across these uh, in literary theory you can talk about identity from the from a gender point of view uh from uh, from a dalit studies point of view from a black point of view so i i don't know if i'm supposed to uh, to uh, to define identity uh, here uh and the point about self and other so obviously we are talking about a dichotomy uh, of of some kind uh, whether it's the colonizer versus the colonized uh, uh, uh the oriental versus the occident so on and so so forth so obviously for the self uh, the the other is something it, it, it has alienated uh, it does not really identify with but as we've seen with with writers like fanon or even foucault who who says you know even uh, so i i spoke briefly about foucault uh, and how uh, there are structures of power but foucault also says that you know uh, for somebody to assert power there should be somebody else who is oppressed something similar has been said by fano also that the colonizer and the colonized they exist in in some kind of a uh, of a dialectical relationship uh, so fatima i don't know if i'm supposed to you know redefine all this these terms uh, right now but in the context of my presentation i would say that the whole attempt was to break this binary of of self and other uh, so uh, there since there is no universal sexually neutral subject hood uh, this whole sense of self should be revisited unpacked deconstructed because uh, we are living in this particular era so already colonialism has told you that you know the self and other is is an artificial uh, divide to conquer so i can only say that i endorse that kind of perspective and uh, the whole idea was to bring duality into the way we have conceived our uh, knowledge systems and our power structures thank you so much ma'am it's time to end the question and answer session and uh, we will uh, ensure that the remaining questions will be forwarded to the speaker now i invite mr anish k joseph assistant professor and the convener of this international webinar series to convey the vote of thanks over to you sir hello all uh, a pleasant good evening to all who have participated in the second webinar uh, in this international webinar series organized by the department of english saint bertman's college chennai city kerala on behalf of the entire organizing committee and the department of english uh, especially our head of the department professor peter thomas 
I express our sincere gratitude uh, to Dr. Ridhima Tiwari of IAT Darwad uh, for the lucid and effective uh, presentation and the lively uh, interactive session. I also thank all the participants from various parts of the globe, uh, the support of our students and former students, especially uh, Dan, Nina, Toju, and Agil is also acknowledged. Uh, as you are informed, uh, this webinar series includes a total of eight webinars. And in the third webinar on 16th September, at the same time, Dr. Arnapurna Rath of IAT Gandhinagar will speak on network societies and cultural narratives. Hence, uh, let's meet again on 16th, sec uh, 16th September. So thank you all. Thank you all once again. There we end the meeting. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank we have you. come to the end of day two of our international webinar series. Feedback forms are provided in the chat box. Please ensure you fill them accurately as your e-certificates would be based on them. So it was a pleasure to have you among us today. Thank you a lot for joining us. Ma'am, I would also like to say one thing. Our HOD, uh, Professor PJ Thomas, has asked me to read you this. He said, I personally appreciate and deeply thank you profusely. Professor, for your very generous gesture, you were infinitely generous. And he says, I thank her so sincerely for her cognitive generosity and so on. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ridhima. Thank you.